Welcome to the second day of the London Swine Conference. Um, today I'll be your chair for this session. My name is Leanne Huber. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm the new swine nutrition professor in the Department of Animal Biosciences at the University of Guelph. So first of all, I would like to thank our premier sponsors for the London Swine Conference, Better Pork, Farm Credit Canada, Total Swine Genetics, and Xanting Direct. Also, we would like to thank Demeter of Veterinary Services for sponsoring this particular session. It's very important um, and we're very grateful to our sponsors because they really allow us to decrease those registration costs and make sure that we have great meals throughout the conference. So the first portion of our um, session this morning will be the Case DeLang Memorial Lecture. The CFM DeLang Lecture at the London Swine Conference was created to honor Case's commitment to the swine industry and to his students. I have no doubt that his dedication has touched every single one of us in this room and that his hard work will continue to reverberate throughout the coming generations. Case was always thinking about the future and how to better the swine industry through innovative research. His legacy of excellence, originality, and industry engagement is one that won't be forgotten by his colleagues, his students, and his friends. My memories of Case usually revolve around the weekly meetings we had. My, for my meeting, uh, I would knock on his office door and hear a muffled, yo, which was my cue to enter and pull up a chair. No matter how busy he was, he would always carve out time to deliberate the research that we were completing together, the swine industry, and life itself. The insight and advice he provided during those conversations helped to build a foundation that I continue to draw upon and will do so throughout my career. But I would give almost anything to have those meetings back. Two years ago in May, we received the news that Case had taken a turn for the worst and that his time with us was limited. It was an awful time for the members of his lab group but we were also lucky because we were provided with the opportunity to say goodbye to our mentor and to our friend in the form of a letter. I would like to share a few lines from my letter to sum up my thoughts and feelings on Case. You should be extremely proud of both the scientific knowledge and the personnel you have contributed to the swine industry. I can't even fathom the number of lives you have changed. The world would not have been the same without your touch, and I am proud to be a product of your hard work, dedication, and mentorship. I consider you more than just my boss. You are my teacher, my leader, my inspiration, and my champion. You have made me a better researcher and a better human being. Thank you from the very bottom of my heart. And I think this is a sentiment that we can all relate to. After Case's passing, friends at the Ontario Agricultural College created a fund to raise money to fully endow a graduate scholarship that will remain permanently at the University of Guelph. The scholarship will support a graduate student studying swine nutrition, which aligns with Case's contributions to the swine industry, his support of students, and his significance to the University of Guelph community. I'm thrilled to tell you that we have reached 125,000 of our $150,000 goal. Thank you to each and every one of you who have supported this cause so far. And if you haven't yet contributed and would like to do so, please feel free to contact me or any one of the committee members. We have a white ribbon on the bottom of our name tag and we can set you up. It is now my pleasure to introduce our esteemed speaker, Dr. John Patience, to talk about innovative diet formulation arising from external pressures. John grew up on a pig farm just 20 kilometers east of here in Thamesford, Ontario, and I think we can safely say that is where his career began. 
John received his bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Guelph and his PhD from Cornell. He served as, a res as the research director for the Prairie Swine Center for 21 years, during which time he met and recruited Case as a nutrition research scientist for the Prairie Swine Center. John is now a professor at Iowa State University in applied swine nutrition, where he focuses on fat and fiber utilization and metabolism, as well as gut health. He is a renowned swine nutrition researcher and consults extensively in pig nutrition and management within Iowa and all over the world. I can't think of a better person to give the Delang Memorial Lecture. Please join me in welcoming John to the stage. Well, what a pleasure it is for me to be here, uh, in part to kind of be home, and, uh, and in part uh, to recognize uh, what Case DeLonga has meant to us as individuals, uh, to the industry, uh, to the university, and really to the world of science. Uh, Case's influence was way, way beyond Ontario, way beyond Canada, way beyond North America. You could go to just about any corner of the world and get a sense of the contribution that Case has made. He made contributions in so many ways, um, in terms of the science, in terms of his, uh, his uh, um, ability to see what others didn't see, what the rest of us didn't see in data, his curiosity, the fact that he would do basic research but want to always ensure that it could be applied on the farm. His legacy is, uh, is really impressive. Uh, I mean, isn't it fitting that there's the Case DeLonga lecture uh, here at the London Swine Conference because Case was involved in starting this conference, what was it, 18 or 19 years ago? So I think that's very fitting. Um, but if you want to get any other uh, sense of, of uh, Case's legacy, you can just see it in, uh, in Dr. Huber and his many other students. And so Dr. Huber will continue uh, swine nutrition at the University of Guelph, and I think that's great as well. So I wanted to share with you just a few thoughts that other people had about what Case has contributed or what they thought he had contributed. And one was Case as a person radiated great integrity. He was a passionate professor and one of the very best scientists in his field in the world. Another said he was never satisfied with how things were being done today. He preferred to focus on how it could be done better tomorrow. I can only imagine what that meant to his students. <laughs> he was at the forefront of studying the fate of amino acids in pigs after intake. That was a quote that came from the Netherlands. Case aimed to bring new knowledge and nutritional physiology of pigs into practice by incorporating this into a model, and that came from New Zealand. So Case was highly thought of, and for so many different reasons, and probably every person in this room, as Dr. Huber has said, uh, has their own reason to think why Case was so great. Well, on to the topic at hand, and we are living in incre a period of increasingly rapid change. Uh, so here's some technologies and how long it took them to reach 50 million users. The landline phone took 75 years. I have three children and not one of them has a landline phone. <laughs> so we've kind of gone full circle. Airline travel took 68 years. The automobile, 62 years. The light bulb, 46 years. Television, 22 years, but YouTube only four years. Facebook, three years. Twitter, two years. And Angry Birds app, one month. And I have no idea what Angry Birds is, but maybe some of the younger folk can tell me what that is. But it's not an amazing, and we see that in our industry, how rapidly things are changing. Some of the rapidly evolving technology that I was reading about and thinking about, autonomous vehicles. When I, uh, I was flying to the Banff Pork Seminar and uh, sat down with a, a young man from uh, Phoenix, Arizona, I think he said, and he was going up to Fort Mac to provide service to autonomous mining trucks and shovels that were being used by Suncor at the oil sands. They had four trucks and one shovel functioning completely without human interaction. I had no idea that the technology had gone that far. 
And so just imagine what autonomous vehicles could do to our society. I can imagine lots of other people, this isn't, I'm not a creative person by the way, and so I just borrow from everybody else. And, uh, and I read that it could mean, for example, that we no longer own cars. We just, uh, when we need a car, we just phone up an Uber type organization. The car comes and picks us up, takes us where we need to go, brings us home. We don't need a garage. We don't need a car. Uh, imagine, I mean, that's a whole new world. Trucks driving down the road. I was talking to a fellow at Iowa State and he was talking about a company that has a, a four transport, so four semis drive down the road in tandem, two feet apart. Because they want the second truck to slip dream the first and the third, the second and the fourth, the third. And they tremendous savings in gasoline. Uh, and that's, those trucks are on the road. Obviously on an experimental basis. New currencies, Bitcoin. I still don't understand Bitcoin, but what would happen if the currencies became e-currencies? We no longer have a Canadian dollar. We no longer have a U.S. dollar. We no longer have a euro. I don't want to go there. I still like feeling cash in my jeans, but also know there's a whole generation that doesn't carry cash in their, in their wallet. Doesn't even have a wallet, probably. Artificial intelligence, what that can mean to us in our industry going forward and helping us to understand things that we just flat out can't understand now. But with all this information, we get misinformation and we get confusing and mixed signals. Do not enter, enter only. The hot dog uh, package has, uh, the hot dog bun package has hamburger buns and the hamburger bun package has hot dog buns. We are not infallible in our information. You can't read the sign, it says area closed due to extreme grizzly bear hazard. And this guy to me is the epitome of, uh, of, uh, of dedication and commitment and blind enthusiasm. So what are some of the forces that are affecting us in food processing, uh, production, wholesaling, retailing? Well obviously legislation and regulation and you heard uh, about that yesterday as it relates to, uh, to antibiotic use and we've gone through that uh, in 2017 in the U.S. Social and environmental issues which I distinguish from special interest groups because to me the social and environmental issues are those issues that um, we've really come to agree are issues that we really need to attend to whereas the special interest groups they have specific um, goals in mind and, uh, and they may be at odds with even environmental issues and social issues. They may hide under those, uh, under those categories. Market preferences and consumer preferences. This is one that, that troubles me in our industry. Uh, I was at a conference recently and the speaker referred to opportunistic marketing. And that's where somebody decides to market their product by advancing some feature of their product and by doing so, kind of denigrates the rest of the products in that marketplace. So, you know, you're, you're selling um, uh, um, a product which has no fat or fat products in it at all, and you say it's cholesterol free. So some consumers are automatically going to assume that your competitor's product contains cholesterol, even though it doesn't. And this opportunistic marketing, I think we have to be very careful and look in the mirror because we kind of tend to do it ourselves a little bit. But that's certainly a force in our world. Um, economics is, uh, is obviously something. We love our pigs. They make us happy. They make us frustrated sometimes. But if we're not making money, we really can't afford to keep them around. And then, of course, there's the technology that we're dealing with. But perhaps the biggest challenge of our time is the information explosion. And in the university world, we deal with this, but in your world, you deal with it all the time as well. There is so much new information coming out, as I re revealed earlier on. Some of that information is accurate and some of it's inaccurate. How do we tell the difference between the two? There's a greater need then for us to have analytical skills, much better than before, because those sources that we used to depend on for unbiased information or relatively unbiased information, or at least based on experience we had confidence in that source, well now there's all these other sources. 
And we don't want to ignore them because there could be very valuable information there. But is it accurate information? Is it information that can be of value to us? So that leads us, I think, to more cautious decision making. It's unfortunate. I was trying to think of analogies that wouldn't offend anybody. And so uh, let me use the analogy of you're buying a new tractor. And you've always bought John Deere. You've always loved the green paint, great tractors, stood the test of time, good value, etc. But now you want to buy a new tractor and you don't need the same quality as you've had before. And you've heard about a new tractor that's come out. It's called the Crestman tractor. And you think, maybe I should look at this Crestman tractor because it's $25,000 cheaper than my John Deere. And maybe it'll do just as good a job. Well, if you were buying the John Deere tractor and you've always bought John Deere, you make the decision fairly quickly, right? Because you're familiar and you know what you're dealing with. The Crestman tractor, you know, you go talk to Stu and he tells you about it, but you're going to ask more questions. You're going to be more uncertain because you're going outside your comfort zone. But you don't want to miss out on this opportunity to save $25,000. So we tend to become more cautious, especially as we're trying to adapt new technology. So look here. Information doubled between 1750 and 1900. That took 150 years. The next 50 years, it doubled again. The next 10 years, it doubled again. And between 1960 and 1992, information doubled on average every five years, and it's even less than that. And they, now this was a 1992 source, and they were projecting that in the year 2020, information would double every 73 days. How do we keep up? How do we keep up? Well, the sad reality is if we could spend all our time on the computer, we still wouldn't access all the information that we want. Right? We have to, I know personally, I've just decided that I'm just going to spend less time on the internet because I'm burning huge amounts of time and the time that I spend on the internet is time I'm not getting other things done. But it's really hard to do because I'm afraid I'm going to miss out on some information. There's new manuscripts being published all the time on swine nutrition, and I want to know what they're saying, but I can't keep up. There's new journals coming out all the time. Quite frankly, many of them, if not most of them, they're not worth anything. They're just, uh, they're just out to make money, and you can't, you can't have confidence in that information the way we've had confidence in our traditional journals. So I created this knowledge pyramid. So there's the foundation of information that we must have if we're going to survive. And then there's more information built on that foundation that we must know if we want to be truly successful. We want to just survive, we want to actually be successful. And then there's another level of knowledge that we need if we want to lead. If we want to be at the forefront or we want to be at the head of our associations or organizations or societies. And then there's other information we just flat out don't need to know. And I looked at that pyramid and I thought it was okay. But then I really think this is what it should look like. It's kind of up to, so I get rid of the concept of the foundation being broad. And really at the bottom, there's a relatively, of all that information that's out there, there's relatively small amount of information that we need in order to survive. And if you want to do a little better than that, well, you add a little bit more information. And if you add, want to lead, then you add a little bit more information. But there's all this information you don't need. But how do you know that you don't need it? You know, the common phrase that we hear so often is, we don't know what we don't know. And that drives us to try to gain more information and learn new things. And we get all this extra information and then what are we going to do with it? How are we going to deal with it? Well, I think fundamentally, as we go forward, we have to focus on the topics that are really important to us in whatever kind of a job we do. We need to do, we need to have that knowledge that is specific to us and our success. So obviously we're gonna to need to specialize. If you're not going to apply this new information, why spend time acquiring it? It's, it's, sir, sir, it solves our curiosity, but there's an opportunity cost associated with everything and there's an opportunity cost associated with acquiring information we don't need. 
And that cost isn't just the time in acquiring it, but it's the time we spend dealing with it in our minds and it causes us to lose focus on the important things. We need to focus on sources that, uh, that we can have confidence in, where the information is complete and valuable to us. And that, I think, can only really come about by our own experience and questioning and analyzing. And then fundamentally, we just have to accept, and people in the pig industry have done this for decades, just have to accept that we're gonna hire specialists in certain areas because we can't know everything. So we hire new consultants as veterinarians, consultants as accountants, uh, and others. Maybe consultants as geneticists, as nutritionists, uh, because we can't possibly keep up and spend time out in the barn managing our pigs and managing our people and managing our resources. So we have to specialize. So that brings me back to this need to improve our analytical skills. And you would think that as professors, that this is kind of what we're about. We are taught how to analyze data, but we struggle as, I hope that's okay for me to say, we struggle as well in terms of how do we interpret this data. And I'll give you some examples of what we struggle with. But we must demand proof. We're in an information age now and information is power. And so we must demand proof. We're not just gonna make decisions on hearsay. We're not, even if, we, if it comes from someone or some source that we've traditionally had confidence in, we need to have proof. We need to question our own biases. And I'll come, I got a, another slide on that. I really believe that because of this information explosion and the demand for us to identify the information we need and the information we don't need and how to sort through it and how to be effective in this is uh, there's great opportunity for training here and how to uh, understand knowledge and how the mind thinks and how we acquire it. Um, believe it or not, that is a field in which philosophers excel. Well-trained philosophers understand the whole concept of thought and uh, creating hypotheses and testing hypotheses. Imagine, I took philosophy as an undergrad because I needed a, an extra credit and I didn't understand a word they said all semester. And now I'm thinking, it's just like I didn't take typing in high school and I wish to God I had. Right? And I wished I'd listened to philosophy a lot more as an undergrad because it would really help me today. The world changes. But fundamentally, we have to have confidence in our own abilities. You have to have confidence in your ability to know what's best for you, to use the sources that you have confidence, and to acquire the knowledge that you need and no more. Because fundamentally, we can't escape the truism that incorrect information is worse than no information at all. Right? Because if we have wrong information, we're going to make a decision, and unless we're awful darn lucky, we're going to make the wrong decision because we have the wrong data. But we think we've, we've got the right data, and we think we've made the right decision. So let's just have a little fun here for a few minutes. Let's take a look at this photograph. Uh, some of you have heard me speak before, and I've used this, uh, this picture before. Looks pretty straightforward. Uh, truck went through the guardrail, uh, did a 180, was parked in the ditch, some guys there are looking at the wreck. Uh, it doesn't look too terribly ser serious until we look at the whole picture and we can see it was bloody serious because there's the truck at the very top of that precipice which is hundreds of feet tall. Take a look at that and say, oh my God. The first message is you don't know the answer to the question until you know the whole story and there's the whole story. But my question to you now is, is that a real picture? Or is that Photoshop? So you go back here and take a look at that picture, you see those guys that are standing beside the pickup truck. Do you think they'd be standing there like that, with a precipice like that? They got bigger kahunas than I got, if that's the case. 
I've looked at shadows and everything in that picture. I can't see it, but I'm pretty confident that that's been photoshopped. How about this one? Can you imagine anybody building a bridge like that? It has to be photoshopped. But it's there in a picture, it's an image, and your experience tells you that it's got to be wrong. But what about other images? I mean, that's, that's a very poor job of photoshopping, because if you look at the shadows and stuff like that, you can see it's wrong. And, of course, nobody, nobody would build a road like that. What about this picture? Has that one been photoshopped? So let's get a little closer to home. You're a little more comfortable with this. Um, you got one pen of pigs who are clearly terribly chilled, and right beside it, you got a pen of pigs that are happier than clams. Is that possible, or has that been photoshopped? Well, I took the picture, and it's not been photoshopped. The pigs in the near pen, they're the, that's the sick pen. What do sick pigs do or don't do? They don't eat. If you don't eat, you're not generating any metabolic heat. If you're not generating any metabolic heat, then the temperature that you need to be comfortable in is going to be higher than the temperature that other pigs in the barn will be comfortable in. So when we have a sick pen, we need to have a brooder or something to help those pigs get over their chills. What about this one? There's 15 pigs on this sow. Has that been photoshopped? Hell no. Lots of sows have 15 pigs a litter now. That's not, that's not uncommon. So, you see, what I'm, I'm trying to illustrate is the closer we get to our own familiarity, the better is our ability to determine whether something is true or not. But even when something is true, we still want to question it to say, is it really possible? And the farther away we get from our comfort zone, the more homework we have to do to determine is this really true? But there's this, this term called confirmational bias. And it's something that every researcher in the world has to be aware of. So what is confirmational bias? It's the tendency to favor information that confirms our pre-existing beliefs or biases. I'm running a trial and I'm looking at a new feeding regime. And I take a look at this feeding regime and I say, geez, I think this should, uh, this should increase growth rate, so I'm going to measure body weight and feed intake and determine feed conversion because I think this is going to improve growth performance. So I run the trial because my, my bias is, is that this product or this program will improve growth rate. And let's just say in this particular study, growth rate wasn't affected at all. And I didn't measure mortality. But the reality is, that feeding regime reduced mortality. But because of my confirmational bias, I didn't measure uh, mortality because I didn't think it mattered. Right? So I have to be very careful when I design an experiment to make sure, to the best of my ability, that I avoid confirmational bias. It impacts not only how we collect information, but how we interpret it. If I believe that this feeding program improves growth rate, and it did improve growth rate, I'd be really comfortable with that. But if I believe that it shouldn't have improved growth rate, and it did improve growth rate, I'd say, hmm, did I miss something? Is there something about this group of pigs that uh, they shouldn't have grown faster and they did? And I'm questioning it because of my confirmational bias. So it can prevent us from looking at situations objectively. And we all, have, Lord knows, we all have our biases about what's right and what's wrong, what's the right genotype to, to have in my barn, what's the right feed to have in my barn, what's the right ventilation system to have in my barn, when I convert to group housing as sows, what's the right system to adopt. We all have our biases. So confirmational bias can cause us to not accept what is true or to accept what's not true just because it fits in with what we believe to be true. When I was younger, I used to think that everybody was, uh, was uh, love change. Everybody says, oh, I love change. 
I love your job that you're offering because it offers me a lot of change. Well, I found out fairly quickly, still pretty young, a lot of people don't like change. In fact, there was an article in Forbes magazine recently that said 62% of the people that they surveyed are uncomfortable with change. Two people out of three. There's only one person out of three likes change. Agriculture is changing. Food production is changing. Is it any wonder that people are questioning what we're doing? Because a lot of people don't like change. What a lot of people really like is variety. So when a person says, I really like your job, they're not saying because it offers me change, it offers me variety. And variety is change within our previous experience. So it doesn't take us out of our comfort zone. Change takes us out of our comfort zone. So you're switching from stalls to group housing, that might take you out of your comfort zone. Right? But you know you can be successful because lots of people have been. So with cautious decision making, how many good quality scientific studies do you have available to decide uh, to make a decision? Are you going to buy this tractor from Crestman? How much data do you have to make that, um, that decision? And never underestimate in nutrition, in genetics, in physiology, in health, uh, the value of repeated experiments that all give you the same answer. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Ernie Peo at the University of Nebraska was quoted as saying one time, uh, one of the worst things you can do to good research is to repeat it. <laughs> and it so often happens, right? But repeatability, if I run the, an experiment twice and get the same answer, boy, I have a lot of confidence in that information, irrespective of what the p-value is. But let's talk about the p-value. What does the p-value really mean when you're looking at data and somebody says, well, the p-value is less than 0.05? What that's really saying in approximate terms, and if there's a statistic geeks, and I've seen, I know there's some geneticists here, Brian, and others, so I, I know this isn't exactly right, but just vaguely just, to, just allow me to say, that if the p-value is less than 0.05, it means that there's only one chance in 20 that the difference you're looking at is due to chance. So 19 times out of 20, that difference that we're seeing is real and not due to chance. So um, what value of p do I need to make a decision? <clears throat> well, in the, in the world that, that I live in now, and that Joel lives in and Mark lives in, Pork producers are willing, or nutritionists are willing to look at p-values of 0 0.1, 0 0.15, even 0 0.2. If the reward is high and the risk is low, I'm prepared to take more risk, right? In order to achieve the reward. So if I'm gonna make a change in my feeding program and I'm gonna, I can save $2 a pig and it's only gonna cost me 25 cents a pig, I might accept a p-value of 0 0.1 or 0.15. I might say, oh, okay, instead of uh, only one chance in 20, I've, I've got uh, one chance in 16, one chance in 15, right? Or something like that. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm willing to take more risk. It all comes down to the economic impact or other benefit that it provides in the risk. And it always comes down to economics, because they said, if we want to be in our business, if we want to do the good things that we do, we have to pay the bills. Okay, so let's talk about some of the trends that are affecting or will affect in the future the way we feed pigs. So yes, I finally do get to the topic of my, my talk again. Reduced or no antibiotics, that's for real, and I'm going to talk about that in, in, in a minute. Competition for ingredients from other industrial uh, requirements, other industrial markets. You know, in the United States now, almost as much corn goes into ethanol production as goes into feeding livestock. That's a quantum change in our world in less than 15 years. That's huge. Some, uh, some markets want us to feed animals diets that have no animal products in them. And for various reasons. I've wondered about precision agriculture and um, you know, in, in cropping, we see lots of examples of precision agriculture, but we don't see it so much 
in livestock production. And I want to talk about that a little bit later as well. Advances in animal genetics. How do we feed a sow that's, if we're, if we're producing over, over 30 pigs per sow per year, do we need to feed our sows differently than when they were producing 25? You know, intuitively we say yes, but it's not really true. The whole question of feed mill biosecurity is becoming much bigger and feed mills are going to look a lot more like food mills in the future because the demands on, uh, on health are going to be higher. Unfounded fears of GMOs, I probably shouldn't have put the word unfounded in there and just said fear of GMO to fit in with the rest of the list, but I guess I'm getting so dang frustrated by people talking about the dangers of GMOs when the data to show that there's any dangers is lacking. Opportunistic marketing I've already talked about. Feed and food safety. More surveys than not if you ask consumers what's important to them. Well, price is important. Some will talk about the well-being of the animals, but more often than not, tastiness and safety are very high on their list. And then risk to the supply chain. In the past 12 months, we've just gone through a situation where it looked like we might not be able to get all the vitamin D we need because of a fire. Who would have ever thought one fire could make the world short in vitamin D? Well, maybe we should look at where all our other ingredients come from, where all our other uh, inputs come from and say, are there other risks out there that we need to be aware of? And if those risks exist, how should we be dealing with them and how should we prepare for them? Because you can't feed pigs without vitamin D. Okay, well let's just look, I'm not going to dump a whole bunch of data on you, but I do want to go over some data. And the point on this slide is, is that sometimes when we add, we'll call them the new generation of feed additives, actually makes antibiotics more effective. In this particular trial, we had the control diet with no antibiotics and FP is a fermentation product. Feeding the fermentation product by itself provided no value. Uh, the antibiotic provided some value, but the antibiotic and the fermentation product together provided an improvement in body weight at the end of the trial. So I, now that's not why we really are evaluating a lot of our new, new generation feed additives. We're looking at feeding them by themselves, but maybe we should expand our thinking a little bit because some of them may improve the effectiveness of the antibiotics that we are using. This is a, a study that results really surprised us. In this study, we compared xyl xylanase, X minus no xylanase, X plus with xylanase, EB minus enzyme blend, no enzyme blend or with enzyme blend. And you can see that we got a significant improvement in average daily gain when we fed the enzyme blend. Interestingly, in those same group of pigs, as you can see on the far side, the lactulose mannitol ratio goes down, which means that that enzyme improved the uh, barrier function in the intestinal tract. And we don't feed enzymes to improve gut health. And yet that's exactly what we see in this slide. You can see on the healthy barrier, at the top is the lumen of the intestinal tract. The bottom is inside the intestine or the blood, bloodstream side. And there's proteins in there that are marked and that prevents you know, small particles, bacteria, viruses, fragments from entering into the bloodstream that should not enter the bloodstream. But sometimes that gut barrier function is broken down in certain illnesses and molecules get through and get into the bloodstream and cause all kinds of problems, including a substantial immunological response. Who would have thought that an enzyme would help provide protection? Sometimes, we're, in the, well, for sure going forward, we're going to feed more byproducts. And when we feed more byproducts, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, that means we're feeding more fiber. This is a study done by Christensen Farms. They added different levels of, I think it was corn bran, and they lowered the energy level of their diets. And as you can see by the feed cost, actually by feeding the higher byproduct diet, feed cost went down. But unfortunately, the pigs didn't grow as fast. So they had to make up in the lowest energy diet four kilograms of carcass that was lost, which meant six, over six days more in the barn, which also meant 88 cents in housing cost increase 
and $5.28 extra feed to get that four kilograms back. So we, looking at feed cost per pig, we think we save money. Looking at, uh, at uh, the actual cost, however, to a constant body weight, we actually wasted $4 rather than saved money. So let's just go down our list as I wrap up here. We're going to have greater considerations as we go forward on the functional properties of ingredients. Right now, we tend to formulate diets that the ingredients bring amino acids and vitamins and minerals and energy into the mix. And we blend them in a way to make sure that we meet the requirement. But in the future, we're already doing it in starter diets, right? Because we put whey products or milk products in the diet. That's for functional properties. We put in maybe plasma proteins or other products into those diets. That's for functional properties. But beyond that, we typically don't. Well, we're going to, in the future, we're going to be formulating not only just on nutrients, but we're going to be formulating on functional properties because gut health is going to be important to us, especially if we're, not, if we're going to be reducing or eliminating, in some, for some people, uh, antibiotics. We're going to select specific fiber sources to fulfill specific functions, and this gets back to the functional properties. If I have a risk of E. coli in my barn, I want to add a soluble fiber source into that diet because that soluble fiber uh, source will stimulate fermentation and it will help that gut and the microbiota in the gut resist the E. coli. But if I put an insoluble or poorly fermented fiber in that diet, I'm going to have the opposite effect, and that could be negative. So I'm going to want to put certain kinds of fiber into the diet in certain circumstances and not in others. There's some challenges with implementing that, and I'll come back to that. Our, as we utilize our next generation of feed additives, I'm sorry to say, because I don't think it's good news, but I'm very uh, confident that we're going to have a, 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 a menu of feed additives that we can use to advantage in our diets. But they're, unlike antibiotics, which worked almost universally, this next generation of additives are only going to work in certain circumstances. Right? And so we're going to, in order to get the best bang for our buck, we're going to want to feed them only in those circumstances. But man, how do we implement that in high volume feed manufacturing? That's going to be a challenge because right now we put them in hoping that we might put two or three into the diet, hoping one works in one situation, another in another, and we kind of cover our bases that way. But that's going to be a challenge of implementation. We're going to focus then more on the mode of action of these feed additives so we can understand where we should be using them. So we don't just put them in and hope for the best. We don't put them in. We cannot expect this new generation of non-antibiotic feed additives to do what antibiotics did for us in the past. They just can't. They don't have the same mode of action. And so unless somebody comes up with some really cool new products right now, as alternatives, they truly are alternatives. They're alternatives in function. They're alternatives in their mode of action. But they can still give us a benefit. But we can't expect them to do for us in the future what antibiotics did in the past. We're going to have to control in the future our supply chain much more carefully, both from a, from a biosecurity point of view, from a uh, and from a, just a risk of continuous supply point of view, and that also means transportation. I think if we try to move forward with um, uh, more precise, you know, precision agriculture, we're going to be feeding to specific circumstances. But again, the implementation of this with large scale feed manufacturing is going to be a problem. I can see the easy part would be many of our mills, they mix they have a loadout bin of phase one, phase two, phase three, and so on, and they mix to keep those bins filled, and the trucks come and pick up the diet that they need. Well, when you apply that, those diets on different farms, you apply them according to a different feed budget. So those animals that have higher nutrient requirements, you leave them on phase one longer and phase two longer and so on, and those pigs that have a lower requirement, you take them off of phase one sooner and put them on to phase two sooner. It's, it's not going to be an easy implementation. So that, that one is, remains to be seen. Greater demands on feed mill biosecurity. Um, we've talked about that, but food safety is so very, very important. And 
and we will be under greater microscope in the future and so we're just going to have to accept that that uh, that feed mills and birds and rodents and so on represent a risk that we're going to have to attend to we're going to use more ingredients in our diets i think that goes without saying and that could have implications on how we build our new feed mills or expand them I think we're going to use, we're already seeing water being used as a vehicle for delivery medication to pigs. You can change water much more quickly than you can change feed. However, you waste more water than you waste feed. So there's pluses and minuses on that one. But we might even be supplying nutrients through the water uh, as well as medications or other additives. I think we're going to adopt net, and if you haven't already adopted net energy as we move forward with more byproducts, um, you might as well take the plunge. Um, there's no reason not to. And then my final innovative approach is to pray like the devil for another uh, person to come along who had the modeling skills that Case had. Because if we really want to move into the next generation of nutrition, uh, modeling is where we're going to need to go. But it takes somebody really uh, with exceptional skills like Case to do it. And there's not a lot of people like that. So what's it going to be important in the future to be successful in the pig industry? Well, the same as it was when I was an undergrad at the University of Guelph. Pig management, people management, and financial management. Now, as the industry has evolved, people management and financial management has become much more important. But pig management, what we used to call husbandry, still number one. Right? No matter what other things we do, the way we handle our pigs, the way we manage our pigs, the way we treat our pigs is still number one. And finally, there's a whole lot of reasons why I like working in the pig industry. You guys are part of that. My students is another big part of that. And uh, what I have up on the screen is a really big part of that. So thank you very much. And uh, I think I've used up all my time. So uh, I'll save you the... Uh, embarrassment there at the end, but I'll be around at break. Anybody has any questions, and you can always reach me by email as well. Thank you, John. Okay. Uh, don't go too far. We have something for you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> London Swine Committee uh, has chose a painting um, created by a local pork producer, Fran Rollins, from Middlesex County. And it's called The Embrace. It depicts two leaves floating in harmony together on a rural Ontario pond on their farm. Um, I'll show you all if you can see. The larger leaf represents Case mentoring all of those he impacted in the swine industry. And it reminds us of the loving and caring nature of a wonderful human being whom we miss every single day. So thank you, John, for this. And I hope you enjoy this painting. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.